Good afternoon, everybody. We've gone a couple of minutes past 12. So we will get the today's coffee science seminars session started. Uh, next slide, please, Carl. So today we'll be hearing about RNAi for crop protection against viruses and insects. Next slide, please. Uh, for those of you who I am yet to meet in the audience today, my name is Narelle Manzi. Um, I'm a research fellow slash science manager here at the Centre for Horticultural Science, and I'm based within Nina Midas Group. So for the past five years or so, I've been helping Nina and the researchers in our team develop uh, an alternative to pesticide for broad acre crop protection using RNA, I, and bioclay. Uh, next slide, please. Before we start today's seminar, we'd like to acknowledge the country. The University of Queensland, UQ, acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australia and the global society. Next slide, please. So there are, before we start, there are a few housekeeping uh, things to mention. This seminar is scheduled for between 12 and 1 p.m. And at the conclusion of the seminar, we will hold a question and answer session. So if you have questions that you would like answered, then please put together as many of, the, as, of them as you can. Use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and not the chat button. The chat button will um, be unlikely to be monitored, so please do use the chat button. Not the chat button, sorry, the Q&A. Uh, so next slide, please. So today we have the great privilege in hearing from an amazing researcher today, Dr. Carl Robinson. I'll give you a quick synopsis of his, his background so you'll be able to uh, get into your mind what, what sort of uh, research he brings to this field. So Dr. Carl joined Coffee CHS in 2012 as a molecular biologist specializing in RNAi applications against animal and plant viruses. And Carl has held postdoctoral research positions within the Queensland Government and the University of Queensland at the Agricultural Biotechnology Centre and the Viral Pathogenesis and Vaccine Group at the VDO, the University of Saskatchewan, Canada, and as an Advanced Queensland Research Fellow here at UQ. Carl is currently a UQ Amplify researcher investigating spray-on applications for viruses and insects in high-value horticultural crops and delivers the plant virology lectures into the SCMB third year virology course. So I've known Carl for uh, many years since he started his uh, PhD back at, I believe we were called the Queensland Agricultural Biotechnology Centre, so QABC, uh, a very great many years ago. So, uh, and had the privilege within the last five years of helping Carl develop this RNAi as a as a possible uh, commercial product, um, if you'd like to take it away, Carl. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Manzi, for the very, very kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, to, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and I'd like to thank you to the Coffee Seminar Series organisers for the invitation, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak about my research today regarding um, RNAi-based biopesticides for plant virus and insect control. So let's get into it. I too also acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship on the lands on which we're zooming today and I pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants as well. So Narell basically covered a little bit but um, a little bit more about me. I'm, um, I've got a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Microbiology so um, wastewater treatment plants, sewerage plants, that sort of thing. I've got a master's degree in clinical microbiology. And part of that program was uh, a professional placement. And this was my first foray into uh, virology. I was billeted out to the Animal Research Institute and um, within the animal uh, room and ecology group. And this is where, um, 
there I was isolating bacteriophages, so viruses of bacteria. And here's a couple of the little critters there. And this work was, we were isolating these two uh, lyes, shigatoxigenic E. coli in the rumen of, of cattle. At this time, I was also working at the CJ Pound Tick Fever Research Centre, which is a small vaccine production facility at the back of Wacol, um, make vaccines for, for tick fever. So my career has basically been about viruses and, and, and vaccines. I then had the opportunity to read for a PhD with um, Professor Tim Marnie and uh, Professor Joanne Mears at the Veterinary Science School. And we were looking at um, live viral vaccine candidates for um for cattle in feedlot against in feedlots against uh, bovine respiratory disease, and we were using bovine herpes virus as a, as a as a vector to deliver vaccine antigens. My first postdoc it was relatively successful work that was. So um, my first postdoc we were translating those technologies into to protect uh, poultry production enterprises against um, Marix disease, and we were using turkey herpes virus as a as a, a vector for delivering those antigens. As Narelle said, I went over to uh, Canada and I was at the Vaccine Infectious Diseases Organization there, and that's at University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And I was continuing my work on bovine herpes virus there and a lot, a bit more mechanistic work on how the virion actually um, traverses the cellular structures. There it is there. As you can see, it's quite an extreme climate and that there is my office window. So it was pretty good. It was a good time. I then returned to Australia and uh, I joined Professor Mitter in her group and we were working on a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation grant where we were using, we were delivering RNA on a inner clay platform that's uh, been termed bioclay and trying to, uh, trying to uh, mitigate plant virus infections. So it was, it was pretty new, fangle dangle sort of work back then. And this is the work that I've been continu continuing on with. Um, I was... Very fortunate to secure an advanced Queensland research fellowship where we were looking at um, transmission modes of plant viruses and trying to mitigate that. And I'm currently a UQ amplifier researcher where we're looking at RNAi for crop protection. So what am I going to be talking about today? Obviously, I'm going to be talking about the problem and putting into context the, the problem of viruses in horticultural production enterprises. I'm going to outline the aims of my research and, and my approach to mitigating virus infection in, in horticultural crops. And obviously this is using spray on RNA interference. A very brief snapshot of the work that I have been doing most recently over the last couple of years. And um, I'm gonna show you that we can actually limit virus infection in plants by targeting the virus. We can modify the ability of viruses to retain viruses, and we can actually um, disrupt the, uh, the, the homeostasis and the fitness of the vectors. And then hopefully, where am I going with all of this? Um, there's a lot of translational work that we're going to do. And there's, a, there's as you can appreciate, there's several uh, hurdles to doing that. And if we can actually bolster IPM programs in industrial settings. Um, I hopefully have a project starting relatively soon, hopefully tomorrow, um, where we're starting to translate these uh, RNAi um, applications into grain crops. And we're going to be targeting the yellow viruses there. So as you can all appreciate, um, global yield loss from crop diseases is around 16 to 20%. Uh, that's in good years. Um, viral pathogens account for about 50% of the disease incidence in crops presently. And there's quite a substantial price tag to that. And it's equating to about 30 billion annually. As you can appreciate, the successful management of viruses is a very, very complex challenge because there are no viruses. There's just no viruses. There's insecticides, pesticides, fungicides, mitocides, all of those sorts of things, but, but no virucides. And virus infection is actually largely addressed by the application of chemical insecticides targeting the vectors. But then this has its own inherent problems because by using chemical control methods, even judiciously, we have, we're seeing increasing rates of resistance. So we're having uh, diminishing returns there. We also have persistent effects of ecologically active chemicals in the environment. Also, there's the retirement of chemicals. So there's the, the broad spectrum of chemicals basically aren't available anymore. Um, good example of this is neonicotinoids. Um, basically that was retired because it was just absolutely too toxic. Um, and off the back of the organic movement, um, we're seeing increasing community awareness of the detrimental effects of insecticides against our beneficial organism, our beneficial insects and pollinator insects. And there still is substantial community aversion to genetically mod modified food and fiber. And I'm going to say that's probably the best way to protect plants from virus infection, but uh, we're not there yet. 
So there is this emerging focus on alternative, environmentally friendly and sustainable methods to protect plants. And it is my opinion that RNAi biopesticides can actually do that. So RNAi or RNA-based biopesticides have been developed around this mechanistic, uh, around the mechanism of RNAi. So RNAi is an endogenous, sequence-specific antiviral defense and post-transcriptional gene regulation mechanism present in most eukary eukaryotic organisms. Gene silencing is mediated by small interfering RNAs, which induce a sequence-specific degradation of a homologous target. Now, there's several ways that we can induce this system in our plant. We can use virus-induced gene silencing, and this is, use, this is the use of, of, of weaker strains where we can get a cross-protective sort of effect happening, or we can introduce a recombinant virus to deliver dsRNA into those plants. Now, that's probably more on the research scale but um, it, and not really translatable all that much. The second way is host-induced in gene, host gene silencing. So this is your GMOs. This is genetic modification of a plant's genome to express dsRNA. So we can introduce a transgene into plants. But the approach we're using is spray-induced gene silencing. So this is the exogenous application of dsRNA onto the plant's surface to induce the protective RNAi mechanism. So basically what we do is we spray on our dsRNA this enters the plant, and the plant actually recognizes this as foreign. It then recruits dice-alike enzymes in that dice this double-stranded RNA up into small interfering RNA. This recruits argo-like argonaut proteins, which then incorporate it into the RNA-induced silencing complex. This risk then starts to surveil all the RNA in the cell, and once it finds a homologous match, targets it for destruction. But we have a propagative signal here. So these degraded products here can be primed and we have RNA dependent RNA polymerases that come along and synthesize the second strand. This then recruits DCLs and we have another subpopulation of sRNAs that are generated and we have a circular sort of um, mechanism here. It's a self-propagating, so it's an amplification pro um, uh, signal. And that's the system we're priming before the plant encounters a virus. So when the plant does encounter that virus, it can mount an immediate response. So basically, oh, so that is the basics, and we'll see how I'm actually applying this now. So how do we actually use RNA, RNAi against viruses? So precedent does exist, and it was the work of Tenlado in the early 2000s that kicked off, kicked it off with uh, these three papers, and we've got several several papers out ourselves now over the, over the years since 2012 and we've worked on several viruses um, we've worked on cucumber mosaic virus uh, pepper mild model virus tomato spotted wilt virus bean common mosaic virus pvy uh, potato virus y and uh, papaya ring spot virus so all of our work to date has been it's 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 successfully shown that we do have a proof of concept for the topical application of dsrna to induce rna i to protect plants against viral infection. The virus I'm currently working on is Zucchini yellow mosaic virus. This is a potivirus. Potivirus is the largest group of plant infecting viruses and there's 160, 176 distinct species. ZYMV is a single stranded positive sense RNA virus and mainly infects cucurbits and it causes devastating disease in these crops leading to you know, significant yield losses and fruit quality defects. So it was this exact virus that actually wiped out the melon crop in WA probably about several years ago now. As a virus, pathology-wise, it creates beautiful symptoms, as you can see here. So this is the ZYMV in zucchini. This is it in pumpkin. And when we received this virus, I actually put it through its paces to see what it would do in cucumber. And um, I infected several varieties. Um, beautiful symptoms again. Um, pathology of the fruit, as you can see, is very virulent virus and causes uh, a lot of destruction. This is this is mature. This is mature. This is as mature as this fruit is going to get. And as you can see, we have chlorosis, we have um, blistering, we have uh, mosaic, and we have massive amounts of deformation. And they don't actually taste any good either. This is ZYMV in its namesake, so zucchini. And as you can see. You wouldn't be able to sell this fruit. We can sell lots of pathology here and lots of blistering and bubbling. And we have in the immature fruit, um, lots of chlorosis and, and mosaic and, and lots of damage, basically. So 
We've worked on several viruses and have successfully shown a good level of protective efficacy when using spray on RNAi. So the question that I had was, can RNAi protect against such a virulent podivirus? So we set up several experiments to test this. This is a, uh, a protection efficacy and persistence efficacy trials. So there's two experiments here, and we'll just go through the protection and protection one. So we get our dsRNA that's targeting the coprotein of uh, ZYMV. We spray the plant, we allow five days to pass, and then we mechanically challenge these plants with virus. We then wait several days, and this is 10 days in this case, uh, then we do our pathology scores, and then we do ELISA, so serological detection for viral titers. The second experiment that we were doing here was the persistence, so the longevity of how, how long, how long the, the protective efficacy um, works for. So we get several groups, and what we would do is we spray the plants all on day zero, and then we sequentially challenge them at different time points. So group one, spray day zero, challenged, mechanically challenged on day five. Second group, spray day zero, mechanically challenged day 10, and so on, out to 25 days. So we get excellent results. Protection efficacy, pretty good. We're getting 60 to 80% reduction in infection incidence with uh, just naked DSRNA, raw DSRNA sprayed on. When we put it onto one of our delivery platforms, we're getting 80 to 90% reduction in infection incidence. Um, but this is a static point, so this is just five days. So what is the persistence of protection? We were getting significantly significantly lower ZYMV load in, in, in both our, our applications, so naked and our delivery platform, treated plants, before day 20. And as you can see here, we've got good protection, good protection. Day 15, we're starting to slide at about 30% of the plants starting to infect. But when we started, when we infected at day 20, we saw no protective efficacy. So we're assuming now that we can get RNAi mediated protection for about two weeks. Now I must stipulate these applications aren't formulated. I'm not gonna go into formulation and all that sort of thing, but we can actually extend the protective efficacy and we can also extend the persistence efficacy. So the conclusion that I can draw from the work that we've done with ZYMV Presently, is that we can protect a host production plant from an extremely virulent virus for up to 15 days, which is an achievement in itself. But so what? Who cares? When looking at applying RNAi by pesticides, if we're only targeting the virus, we're only looking at one third of that picture. So the complete picture actually looks like this. And as we can appreciate, as the graphic here shows, that the virus vector plant interaction is a complex interplay of numerous factors which are highly independent. And it is my opinion that RNA by, RNA, by, RNA by pesticides, they just won't work if we're targeting things individually. But if we apply RNA by pesticides against the virus, the vector and the plant in a holistic approach, um, we have a real chance of, of developing effective by pesticides against viral infection in horticultural crops. So, we have a back catalog of success on viruses. So let's start applying RNA by pesticides to the natural transmission systems. And this is the vectors. So my work presently is on hemipterans, since aphids are the primary vectors for numerous plant viruses, but we work on several, several virus, uh, several insects and vectors. Most recent success has been with um, White flies, and this is the work of Dr. Ritesh Jain, who co supervised him in his PhD, and he absolutely just knocked it out of the park with, um, with his PhD and applying RNA biopesticides. We've got excellent progress with double uh, tomato spotted wilt virus with um, Dr. Alex, Dr. Alexander Nilon, co supervised him in his PhD as well. And we're also working on thrips, and we've got some pretty good pretty good success with um, applying RNA biopesticides to thrips. And this work was done by Dr. Senthil Kumar, who was a visiting fellow from the Indian Spices Research Fellow, and uh, Research Institute, sorry. And we actually have a, uh, a paper in review presently uh, regarding that. We also have a lot of work with RNAi against Lepidopteran species, and this is the cotton bollworm, so Helicoverpa armigera, and this work was done by Dr. Zi Zian Lim. I co-supervised him in his PhD as well, and I've done some preliminary work with um, 
into Fall Army Worm, which is a recent incursion into Australia and is an absolute game changer. And these guys are beasts. So this might be the the, the subject of a talk um, in the future. So we'll just leave them there they are uh, as they are now. As an aside, on working on these insects, it highlights a, a crucial consideration for me in the application of RNA biopesticides to insects. These insects have significant differences in their biology. Hemiptera are piercing and sucking insects. These Lepidopterans, they're chewing insects. They, they ingest a massive amount of plant material. And thrips, they actually scour the leaf. They, they leaf the, the leaf surface. And this basically informs how we actually deliver RNAi to these critters. So with regards to the biology, of aphids and how do we apply RNAi biopesticides to this organism to mitigate virus transmission to the plant. We need a little bit of background there. As I said, most of the plant viruses that we know of are transmitted by an aphid species of some sort. But we can actually further subcategorize plant viruses on how they interact with their host and define them as either persistent or non-persistent. Persistent viruses are able to travel in their, in their host. They can travel to distal sites and they usually set up residency within the salivary glands. They're persistently infected, so they're always going to able, be able to transmit um, a virus. Uh, the viruses are also able to um, invade the, 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 replica the, um, the replication organs. So this sets up a vertical and horizontal transmission modes. But what we're going to talk about today is non-persistent viruses. So these guys are styloborn. So they don't actually enter into the animal. They're unable to replicate in the animal and they're non-circulative. So um, they don't have a transmission from mother to, to baby. So where and how are these non-persistent viruses retained in aphids? Aphids, are retain, aphids retain virus particles via specific interactions between the stylic cuticle proteins and the virus coproteins. So here's our cuticle protein lining the stylet, so right at the tip of the feeding tube. And it's the work of Craig Webster in about 2018 when he was in, in Montpellier. He investigated and identified two cuticle proteins where cauliflower mosaic virus was attaching um, this is an aside cauliflower mosaic virus is where we get the, um, the 35S promoter from. It's a DNA plant virus and it has an RNA replicative intermediate. But CAMV, so cauliflower mosaic virus, uses a helper component strategy of attachment. So as you can see here, it needs a bridging protein to actually attach to the cuticle protein. So we have our cuticle, we have our bridging protein, which is P2, and that then associates with the uh, coprotein of the virion. Potyviruses use the same strategy, but different proteins. Potyviruses use helper component, helper component protein, so HC pro, and they use, and that's how they attach to the cuticle of um, aphids, aphid stylet. Contrastingly, cucumber mosaic virus actually has a direct attachment strategy. So hopefully I can sort of guess where I'm going with this. This actually sets up a lot of um, compare and contrast experiments in the application of RNAi by pesticides with respect to the attachment strategy used by these non-persistent stylet borne viruses. So the question I first asked, can we actually knock down the stylet protein shown by Craig, but can we actually do it? So how we do this is using artificial dye assays. So we use, uh, so we synthesize our dsRNA of, of choice that's targeting the cuticle protein. So this is ST1. We put that into our artificial diet, which is 30% sucrose. We get our 35 millimeter cell, uh, cell culture dishes and we corral about 25 to 30 aphids in there. We then stretch a, a film, a parafilm over that. We apply our diet with uh, containing our, our RNA. And then we put a second sheet of parafilm over that and we create a small little diet sachet. So the aphids are able to penetrate the, the film, the, the, the primary film, and they're able to uh, ingest sucrose and at, with that RNA. We then do mortality counts every 24 hours out to about 120 hours. But at 96 hours, we take a subset of those, um, those aphids 
and we do real time for quantification of transcript knockdown. So when we look at um, feeding aphids ST1 dsRNA to knock down the cuticle gene, we have around 55% mortality, but is linked to a 35% knockdown of the ST1 or the cuticle, cuticle um, transcript. So we've shown knockdown of the putative attachment receptor. So how does this affect? So the next question was, how, do, how does this affect ZYMV? and CMV particle retention. And these two guys have um, different attachment strategies. So we do virus retention assays. Again, we employ our artificial diet assay where we feed them ST1 dsRNA to knock down the cuticle um, gene. We, after 96 hours, then we take half of those and we actually test that we have got knocked down in the ST1 gene. And the other half, the other half of the cohort, we starve them for an hour and then we put on, put them onto respectively um, infected material for about 15 minutes. We then harvest those aphids and then we do the extractions and then we uh, do real-time assays for particle load. So we target the, we're, we're checking for coat protein. So as you can see here, we do have ST1 gene knockdown and it's consistent with our basic artificial diet assays. So pretty good knockdown. However, we have significantly contrasting results when it comes to viral retention load. When we knock down ST1, we have significantly reduced CMV particle retention. But contrastingly, we have uh, significantly increased ZYMV particle retention. So this is obviously suggesting that ST1 is involved in cucumber mosaic virus viral acquisition and retention, and that's a direct attachment strategy. But it also suggests ZYMV uses a different attachment strategy, um, a different attachment protein to ST1. And so this is also in contrast to cauliflower mosaic virus. And although they use the same strategy of attachment, and obviously so this is extremely interesting, um, my PhD student, Jingfeng Liang, presently is currently working on picking this apart. And uh, we've actually got several other cuticle proteins that we're, um, that we're looking at knocking down and doing compare and contrast um, essays and things like that. So basically, we can affect viral particle retention by, by applying an RNAi by a pesticide, um, but it does have caveats. So that's where that is. But if we even step back further, what we've also done now is we've had significant knockdown of an aphid gene by oral delivery of dsRNA effectors. So that sets up the question now, can we target other genes in the aphid? We go back to our artificial diet essay, and we've actually applied um, RNAi against 33 genes um, in Mises persicae to try and disrupt critical metabolic processes. So this is to affect population decline over time. So less aphids, less viral transmission, that sort of deal. In targeting those 33 genes, we've defined nine dsRNA effectors that were able to individually, individual molecules, induce 42 to 65% mortality when fed to aphids in artificial diet. However, they're individual targets and 65%, it's pretty good. However, we can increase that. So the idea was let's start combining individual effectors and see if we can actually stack these dsRNA effectors. When we combined dsRNA, individual dsRNA effectors, we can increase the mortality by about 25%. So now we're achieving 65 to 85% mortality. And we've also got a pretty good construct with when we stack them together. So this is, this is a pentama molecule. So we've got five different genes in one molecule and one dsRNA molecule, and we're feeding that. We're achieving about 54%, which is pretty good with respect to how we've actually made these constructs because the individual effectors are about 300 to 400 base pairs in length. So that's, they're quite large. But with the stack molecule, we had to fit it onto the vector and, and have efficient transcription. We actually had to reduce the size of the individual um, targets. So each target in this one is 150 base pairs, which basically reduces the sRNA pool that can be generated. So um, 
we're still working on that. We can have trimers and, and, and quad stacked molecules as well. So where are we? We can protect plants from virus infection. We can reduce the retention of some viruses in aphids, and we can induce significant mortality targeting aphids with effectors. So the idea now, well, the big question is, can this actually be transferred to an implanter context? And that's where we're heading. So the, the first question, can RNA be taken up by plants? The short answer is yes, dsRNA can readily be taken up and move in most plants. Uh, there is an efficiency of movement aspects with respect to the species that we work on, um, but there is more capable people in the lab uh, that have done some really excellent work on dsRNA movement in the crops that we work on. And I'll leave the mechanistic aspects of RNA movement up to those guys, and hopefully they'll present that work in this forum in the future. But here, what we've got, we've got dsRNA taken up in a hydroponic sense through root uptake. Um, and we can actually flood the plant. So this is Psi 3 labeled dsRNA, and we can actually see that we've got um, dsRNA flooding the plant and is basically available to uh, at the sites where aphids will feed. Um, it's not just the Psi 3 molecule. We, have, we do detect the dsRNA as well. So this, um, we have dsRNA in the plant. Can the aphid take up this DNA? Uh, dsRNA, sorry. They can take it up from artificial diet, as we've seen with the previous work there, and we can affect um, um, gene knockdown in artificial diet essay. So can they actually take RNA up from the plant? This here, we have detected full-length dsRNA in the aphid, so a, a root uptake essay again, aphids put on this, um, and we pick them up. If you look sideways, there is a band here at 24 hours, but if you're, and you know, it's pretty distinctive, this band here. So this is full length dsRNA in an aphid taken up from, from a plant. Now, full disclosure here, I didn't actually look at the sRNA profile of these aphids. So that's that's some work that's that's currently ongoing now. Um, so then this sets up a next question. Is this RNA that these aphids are taking up, is it actually functional? And can we down regulate a target gene? So we basically went in boots and all with this one and went straight to implanter and spraying things on. So we actually took our ST1 dsRNA and we sprayed that onto a plant. We then let uh, several aphids onto these plants and you can see the, the essay, this, this is all very uh, cartoony, but this is the actual essay picture here. We let them uh, roam ad libitum for about um, eight days and then we harvest them and we see if we do have knockdown of our cuticle gene. And we did. When we sprayed plants with D, DS, uh, ST1 dsRNA, we regulated ST1 knockdown by about 30% in aphids from a plant. So this is ST1 that's knocking down dsRNA, uh, that's knocking down the cuticle gene, and it's delivered to aphids via an implanter application. Presently, we're trying to put all this together, and I'm currently doing the trials. Well, my, 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 my students are doing the, the trials to currently... Um, assess mitigated, uh, assess, the, assess the knockdown of aphid transmitted ZYMV. So back to our implanter model to test the protective efficacy of ZYMV specific dsRNA against ZYMV infection via an aphid transmission. Previous trials were done by mechanical inoculation. So we get our coprotein dsRNA and we spray that on our plants. We wait five days and then we take our viriliferous aphids and we apply them to our plant. We let them run around for, no, sorry, we don't let them run around. We let them run around for about 24 hours and then we dispatch those aphids um, using chemical insecticide. And then we wait 10 to 15 days and we do our pathology scores and then we do our ELISA to assess um, viral titer. Um, as you can appreciate, uh, aphid transmission is a highly efficient process, and we did struggle to actually uh, not overwhelm this system completely. Uh, so we did a, a we did a series of essays where we actually found that we could put five aphids on, and we get um, very very good um, infection um, infection model. Um, any more than that, you just everything just gets infected, super infected. Um, so in setting all this up in the growth cabinets and in doing it several times, 
we got pretty average results. Um, we reduced infection incidence by about 50%, which is, which is okay. You know, it's pretty good, but the viral titer, we were just, we were just barely limiting viral titer and we were reducing it by about 27%. However, when we shifted this essay to glass houses and we actually doubled the concentration of the DSRNA that we put on, we actually saw a reduced infection incidence of about 95%. And we saw a reduction in viral titer for about 94%. So this is pretty good, I think. Uh, and, and that's basically where we are presently. Um, we are advancing in putting all of this together as a, as a complete picture. So with this research, uh, so this is a very small snapshot of, of the work that we actually have done in, in the lab over the, several, over the several years I've been here. Um, but with this research, I'm, I'm aiming to develop a strategy to, to protect plants holistically. And by taking our, our prior and continuing research on limiting, limiting virus infection in plants, we're challenging the ability of the viruses to be transmitted by vectors, and we're actually targeting aphid metabolic processes we actually have a real opportunity to challenge and disrupt that virus vector plant interaction using RNAi by pesticides and, and several of the delivery platforms we've developed. So this is basically, hopefully, one day replace pesticides. It's, it's a big task, but um, we'll, we'll see how we go. And, we're a, and, and to an effect, to deliver a clean, green, and persistent and effective crop protection strategy using RNAi by pesticides. So for the future, obviously we're further developing this holistic approach um, and we're you know, trying to define the mechanisms of RNAi by pesticide application. Um, I, as I said, I do have a bit of a project starting hopefully soon um, regarding spray on gene silencing approaches to uh, the yellow viruses, barley yellow dwarf virus and uh, turnip yellow virus. And this will be in um, grain crops, so wheat, barley and canola. Um, another big hurdle that we're actually starting to engage with is the translation of these technologies to protected cropping environs. So the questions that we're asking, can we deliver RNAi biopesticides hydroponically? Uh, we do have um, root uptake experiments and things like that that do show RNA can be tra transferred that way. Um, and also spray delivery. So you know what we do in the in the lab compared to what an industrial spray system is 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 pretty far apart. So we're actually going to try and well, we are um, seeing how RNAi by pesticides and the delivery platforms can actually stand up in those in, in those systems, and also how to translate actually RNAi by pesticides into the integrated pest management programs that, that these these um, industrial um, environs actually have in place already. Um, I don't think it's going to be the, the be all and end all, but it will bolster IPM programs definitely and ultimately save massive amounts of money um, as, a, as an intermediate stop to actually using the, the nuclear option, which is just to insecticide treat your entire glasshouse. So just to give you a bit of an idea of the hurdles that we do have to um, vault over, um, with protected cropping these days is that this is actually a 10,000 square meter glass house. This, these, these places are absolutely amazing. And I'm actually standing in the same spot there. I took a picture to the left. I took a picture straight down the line and I took a picture to the right of me. Um, these are trust tomatoes, very high value crop. So these guys really, really want to um, protect their, their IPM programs in this and uh, stop viral incursion or viral incursion and viral uh, um, any viruses that um, establishing a successful replicative cycle in these environs. I'd like to say thank you to everyone past and present. Obviously um, this is the Mittelab presently. We're spread across two sites here at QBP and over at Long Pocket. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Nurel Manzi right up here in the corner there for uh, looking after us all, definitely. Um, Stephen Fletcher here, our bioinformagician, um, my PhD student, Jing Fang, and my other master's student, uh, Yirong, is working on PVY, and everybody else, oh, my thanks, um, Dr. Ritesh Jain, who really knocked it out of the park with his PhD and his whitefly work, Dr. Alexander Nilon, who did a lot of the, the tomato spotted wilt virus work, uh, Miss Louisa Hallett, 
She uh, did a lot of the um, direct uh, targeting aphid work. Uh, Amanda Wang here, who did a lot of the cuticle work. She's currently a first year PhD student with Paul Gauthier in vertical farming and, and protected cropping applications. So wish her well. Uh, Jonathan Peters, Dr. Jonathan Peters. Uh, he did a lot of work on TSWV in, in uh, well, and, and a lot of other things as well. Um, and a lot of construct design and, and really making um, the synthesis of DSRNA quite, quite efficient. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Worrell, who did a lot of the CMV and BCMV work in uh, initially with um, our delivery platforms and on the first Nature paper. Uh, Dr. Senthil Kumar, who's from the Indian Spices Research, did a lot of the work, uh, the RNAi biopesticide work on, uh, on thrips. And Dr. Zijian Lim, who did a lot of RNAi delivery work to lepidopterans. So thank you, everybody. Um, I'd also like to thank all of my funders and collaborators and, and people who support me, uh, particularly Professor Nina Mitter, who has um, you know supported me and is allow and is allowing me to produce uh, to pursue this this avenue of research. So thanks everybody. Hopefully uh, that was that was okay. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Thank you, Tom. Um, I think that was an amazingly succinct and easy to access uh, presentation from you. So I hope everyone who wasn't a molecular biologist or in the plant space uh, got a lot out of this presentation as well. Uh, so we'll turn to some of the questions that we've got in the chat. Carl, would do you like to read them out and answer them or would you like me to read them and you can answer? You're on mute, Dr. Carl. On mute there, sorry guys. Um, Rick Tang, what are the long-term effects and or potential risks of using a holistic approach in RNAi technology in crop protection? For example, could pests develop resistance over time? So there's been a few lab experiments with um, with uh, Colorado, no, uh, some rootworm, Colorado rootworm, I think it is, uh, where they have shown that there is a resistance development over time, but it was forced. Um, and this was with uh, feeding one target as well. Um, if we're using multiple approach, multiple targets, multiple approaches, bioinformatic approaches, where we're actually um, designing these these essays to be absolutely sp species specific, and if there is any resistance development, um, we can actually quite readily and quite easily move targets. Um, it's not that we'd have to develop a whole new type of chemistry or or anything like that. So. Um, it, it is a concern, definitely. Um, it's, it's limited, but it is definitely on our minds around that. And, and we do have, um, uh, you know, strategies in place to actually combat anything like this, but we haven't seen it presently and I haven't seen it in any of my viruses or, or anything like that. Anonymous NT, um, thank you very much. Uh, attendee, sorry. Uh, thank you very much. I was wondering if the effect of these DSRNAs on the end user being human will be monitored. So this is a, a this is a question definitely that comes up quite regularly. Um, we ingest RNA like it's going out of fashion. Everything that we eat has RNA or nucleic acids in it, and and, and things like that. Um, part of APVMA regulatory uh, regulation uh, registration um, is that we do need to do this. Um, to a certain extent, but this is only on the back of our particle platform. So inhalation studies and all of those sorts of things have to be done. So the APVMA really is all over it. And uh, they have a set of guidelines that we need to stick by for any registrable RNAi product. Hopefully that answers that. Um, hello, thank you for a very insightful seminar. Thank you. You're welcome very much. Um, I was wondering in your estimation, in a real life agriculture setting, how long can the effects of RNAi last after the first application? Also in a hydroponic setting, does it mean that RNAi will be applied periodically in water? This is the basis of our translation um, ideas presently. So we need to actually put our RNA by, by, by pesticides, and I don't really like the word biopesticides, but um, into these systems and actually just see what happens. I mean, we can have little small scale hydroponic stuff here, but translating these things to industrial processes, it, they're miles apart. So we actually really just need to do that. Um, 
the effects of RNAi. So we've got it, our initial work, we've got it out to 30 days, um, and we could probably go a little bit further. But as I said, the work that, we've, that I've presented here is non-formulated. So we do have um, some levers that we can pull to actually extend the protective efficacy and, um, ex yeah, extend the protective efficacy. And yeah, so yeah, I'm looking forward to getting into a hydroponic and I hydroponic systems as well. And we're actually going to visit some people uh, next week. Uh, Dr. Siddle, thanks, Carl. Is the mechanism of reduced penetrance in insects common between species? It seems to seems to be to do with the gut proteins. So the insect gut environment is quite harsh to RNA. If you could uh, imagine that, um, particularly with Lepidopterans, a highly alkaline gut, um, and basically the amount of plant material that they ingest, um, they'll have they have a lot, lot of nucleases running around and uh, a lot of that sort of thing just to digest all proteins, all um, nucleic acids. So we do have platforms that can combat this. So it's a pH trigger sort of thing. So we can put RNA into this, uh, onto this delivery platform. It can um, traverse to the gut. Once it enters the gut environment, we have a pH change. We have a, a release of the RNA. And then we hopefully we have, um, we have um, movement across gut linings and things like that. And then we can affect the genes that we want to target in the gut of these insects. Uh, aphids are a different story as well. Um, there is nucleases in there and we're looking at that as well um, to actually increase the the, the efficacy of, of gene knockdown. So I want to just, uh, yeah, hopefully that answers that question. Okay, thanks, Carl. That's all the questions we have in the Q&A, please. Um, I think... I think we've got one more amazing tool. It's one of the effects of these just end user human B potter. How are the off target effects with RNAi technology combated? So, um, at the bioinformatics stage, basically. So, um, Steve, our bioinformatician, he has a, a bioinformatics pipeline that actually incorporates um, beneficial organism genomes. So, or transcriptomes of beneficial organisms. So, if there's any stretch of around, I think it's 13 to 17 base pairs. It actually um, discards that molecule, um, so we can actually uh, design RNAi molecules that are extremely species specific, um, and basically show no homology to any off targets. And and it's it's a big concern, definitely off target um, off target uh, dsRNA effects. I think that's about it. Okay, thank you, Carl. Um, if there are any Thanks, other questions, everyone. please put them in. We've still got a little bit of time. I have one more question for you, Carl, before we um, close your seminar. Um, you've, you've stated in your background you have quite a bit of animal virus experience as well. Have you tried translating this into the animal virus or human space? Uh, not not the human space, no. I'm, I'm a... I, um... You, yeah, no, I won't say that. But uh, yeah, no, I haven't really worked on human viruses and I don't really want to either. I'd rather stick within the agricultural space, that's for sure. But yeah, I did work on um, some several um, live viral vaccines where we were actually putting uh, an RNAi expression cassette into those backbones. Um, so this was for Marix disease in poultry production enterprises. So the, tr the problem with that vaccine is, so you have a cross-protective uh, vaccine that one is so we give um we give uh, chickens a vaccine turkey herpes virus it doesn't cause disease in chickens per se but it actually gives you a cross protective effect uh to marix disease virus so mdv virus which causes tumors and and paralysis in um in in chickens so what we were doing we were putting rnai cas cassettes into the hvt backbone giving that to chickens because, sorry, I should go back a little bit. So hey, uh, turkey herpes virus actually protects against Marek's disease very well, but it doesn't stop shedding of the Marek's disease virus. So we were putting RNAi constructs into HVT backbone, and then we would give that to the chickens in an, in, in an effort to um, try and use RNAi to knock down the actual 
um, shedding of Marek's disease virus. Um, it was relatively successful. And I believe the trial, we've, we, we did trials down at Armadale um, regarding that one and down at Arl. Um, I believe the paper's still on the shelf somewhere. So there's a few little uh, niggly bits that we need to sort out with it. But uh, yeah, so that, that's the extent of RNAi in DNA viruses for animal work that I'm currently involved with. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Carl. Um, I think I will, uh, on behalf of the participants here, uh, thank you for a very engaging talk. Thank you very oh, much. thanks, guys. Thank you, Nirol. Uh, um, if, yeah, so, sorry, Nirol. If anybody's got any questions or anything, there's my email address. So uh, more than happy to have a discussion, coffee or whatever. So, yeah, more than happy. Yeah, it'd be great if some collaborations come with this too. So everyone, please put your thinking hats on. Uh, for those who uh, are regulars, the next seminar will be held on Tuesday, the 6th of June. And this one will be presented by the team at the Food and Beverage Accelerator. Uh, visit the Coffee Science Seminars webpage this week for more information. And thank you all again for attending this seminar today. Uh, if you've enjoyed today's seminar, please sign up to our seminar invitation list at coffee.uq.edu.au slash science underscore seminars. Hey, thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Speak soon. Cheers. Thank you.